Let's start with prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God and Father, enlighten our minds and our hearts, that we may grow in your grace and in your love. Send your Spirit upon us, so that we may grow in holiness, strong in our faith, and be open to your inspirations. May the Blessed Mother protect us from all evil, and accompany us through this covenant journey. May she shelter us from harmful influences and prepare us better for service to Schoenstatt. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, let's get started. Let me go ahead and show screen. And I don't need this anymore. And I don't need that. But we'll just go put this here in this little corner. So. What I'd like to do tonight is talk a little bit about Schoenstatt's uh, pedagogy and, you know, a series of topics related to the pedagogy or what we're going to, what we are going to discuss tonight is what is a pedagogy? Why is it relevant to Schoenstatt? Examples of Jesus and Mary. Uh, we'll talk about the pedagog pedagogical principles from Father Joseph Cantony, our founder, and then we'll just go ahead and do a, a brief summary of the uh, of, of the presentation. So pedagogy is just a systematic study of, of teaching and learning techniques. Um, it's a professional field of study, and the idea is to understand uh, how different people, how they learn, and what are the best techniques for those types of learners. So its main objective is to, you know, go in and make uh, learning more effective. Um, I think probably the biggest and the most common example that I could give is, you know, looking at the way that we do classroom training versus virtual training uh, in colleges, universities, uh, even, even some high schools. Um, when you're in a classroom face-to-face, -face, uh, the, there is a lot that you can capture uh, and and improve right on the spot in terms of your teaching techniques. You can easily see if a student frowns or if a student um, is you know has a question. You can see that in their eyes and then their demeanor. Uh, versus in the virtual uh, environment, that's a little bit harder to perceive. And because it's harder to perceive, it makes you know uh, trying to find the right technique uh, much more difficult. So I think it's a, it's a great example of, you know, what is uh, the right pedagogy for the right environment. I know that uh, when COVID hit, um, many of the classrooms uh, and many of the teachers, what they did is they did exactly what they had in the classroom. Uh, they did it in the virtual environment. And that doesn't work because the virtual environment requires some other techniques that are different than face-to-face -face classroom. So that's what pedagogy is all about, is finding what are the best techniques or the best methods or the best strategies to, you know, to make those learners actually, you know, understand and incorporate uh, the learning, whatever the learning is. Uh, it is a classroom, or in our case, it's, it's religious and it's Schoenstatt. I think it's a good idea to go over why pedagogy is relevant in general. And of course, this applies to you know the educational sector as well as what we do here in the church. First of all, it has to do with learning effectiveness. If we want to be effective in what we train and what we educate, uh, we, we do need uh, pedagogy because it's like the channels that will help us provide direction and wholeness to what we're trying to do. Uh, many times, and I've criticized this uh, in other forums, uh, the intentions of universities is to make uh, the student much more universal in his thinking, in his critical actions, and in his contribution to community. But, you know, right now, it's, you know, many universities are acting like, um, I guess, uh, vocation schools, where you learn a trade and, and that's it. So being able to look at uh, education from a whole from a wholeness point of view uh, and be able to provide direction at the same time, a specific, very concrete direction, is one of the objectives of, of pedagogy. Also, pedagogy tends to look at, like I said earlier, how to attend to those personal needs. Not everybody has the same learning style. Some uh, learn better by reading. Some learn better by visualizing. Some better uh, learn better by conversation. So, you know, how do we adapt 
uh, or what techniques do we use to adapt to a personal needs? I, I think creating a positive and meaningful environment is also key. There's so much negativity out there and so much confusion that being able to provide a safe space where learning can occur, um, uh, pedagogy uh, has a role in that. Uh, once you establish a, a series of, of workshops or retreats or whatever, and you're using some of these uh, pedagogy techniques, you can see that there is a, 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 a environment where people feel safer in terms of learning different objectives. And of course, uh, finally, you can see the last one there, promoting assessments. I think one of the difficulties that we have, um, not only in the church, but also in Schoenstatt, is as we grow, uh, how do we measure our, our growth? How, how well are we doing this? Uh, how um, what, what needs to still be done? So, I mean, sometimes in retreats, we pause and we tend to look back and see what we have not done well and then move forward. But as an educational tool, as a pedagogy, um, there should be something constant uh, as we talk about learning new techniques. For example, it would be nice. It's not going to happen, so don't worry about it. It would be nice to give a final exam to see how well everybody understands the different concepts of, of what's happening in Schoenstatt and in preparation for their prayer. Uh, that would be a, 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 an assessment. Of course, that's not going to happen, but um, it would be nice to be able to do that. But then on the other hand, you know, I, I don't think we're ready for anything of, of that nature. But in conversation, we can figure, you know, how much a person knows or does not know. So, you know, it would be fair for me to ask a question, well, how do you feel about the covenant? And, you know, how prepared do you feel about the covenant? And you can see that that is a learning tool, but it's not an assessment in terms of, like we think, like a quiz or a test or an essay or a reflective. So, you know, there are ways to promote assessments. And I think that that is something that not only in Schoenstatt, but certainly in the church, uh, we, we should be able to, to, to promote. Um, I remember asking, uh, and, and this is another parish in another diocese, actually. Uh, I asked uh, somebody, do you know the 12 commandments? And the person said, yes, I know the 12 commandments. And I said, well, if you know the 12 commandments, that means you know who the 10 apostles are. And he said, yes, I know who the 10 apostles are. So you can see that my assessment of that person's understanding of church is a little bit awkward. So we had to have a follow-up conversation to, to correct that. So relevance to Schoenstatt. Schoenstatt is a Marian movement. So the context for pedagogy is uh, Marian in flavor, so to speak. And, you know, in, in Schoenstatt, we think and we uh, appreciate and we actually draw, strive for intense formation. In other words, what distinguishes us from many other movements is the intensity that we go about with a formation. And again, when I talk about formation, I'm not talking just about intellectual formation. I'm talking about whole person formation. So the, the covenant of love is the portal. It's the main entry. Uh, it's the main, uh, I, I guess, north for us in terms of uh, formation. Uh, of course, there are other, um, I guess, worldviews, so to speak. But our, our worldview is Marian and deeply rooted in the covenant of love. That makes us uh, quite unique as well. Now, formation is not only personal. Uh, we have to also consider that formation is also in groups or communal. The, uh, one, one of the objectives of Schoenstatt is the new man in the new community. And, you know, it's fine to have new men and new women, but we also have to look at that aspect of community. And community formation is very, very difficult. I know, for instance, when I form groups in some of my classes, um, they say, we, I, this typical student would say, I hate to work in groups. Um, so this hate towards, you know, groups or group formation is something that we have to overcome because uh, the truth is that in Schoenstatt, we're looking for both formation in the personal sense and also in the communal sense, trying to strive for that new community. Another observation with respect to Schoenstatt is that every form of uh, 
formation is directed towards the state of life. In other words, where are you right now in your life? Are you married? Are you single? Are you youth or professional, uh, et cetera? Uh, so you can see, for instance, that the formation that is given to the priest, for example, would be different than those that would give, be given to professionals. Uh, so, so yes, there is a focus on the personal, on the uniqueness, but within a community as well, uh, we're starting to look at the state of life. And one of the, I guess, more confusing aspects, uh, as I ask around, one of the compu confusing aspects is the terminology itself, you know, trying to trying to decipher and trying to communicate what is the difference between formation and education. And many times I hear that they're basically the same. Well, yes and no, right? There, there are certain elements of formation that are that are related to education, but formation goes beyond education. And this is a definition uh, of what I found in, at the seminary, uh, the Mundelein Seminary, the, which is a seminary from Chicago. Um, the uh, PPF, which is a document used to form priests, uh, talks about formation and education. And you can see that education is the process of facilitating, you know, knowledge, skills, values, beliefs, and habits, which you would do for formation as well. But the difference is that formation is first and foremost cooperation with the grace of God. So that's something that, you know, you would not typically expect in a university. However, you would expect that in a Catholic university. But, you know, formation and education are different in that, again, formation is a function of that cooperation with grace, with the grace of God. And pedagogy is not something all that unique. I mean, if you look at uh, the life of Jesus and Mary, you can see that they use also uh, technic um, different strategies and different techniques or methods uh, for, for teaching. I think the most, uh, you know, the easiest one to know with respect to Jesus is the, the parables and how he teaches through parables, but he also teaches through miracles, through questions, through discussions, and sometimes even confrontations uh, with, you know, people in, you know, some of the clergy uh, in, in the synagogue. Um, but also he does speeches, and I think the Sermon of the Mount is probably the speech that comes to mind immediately as I look at, you know, pedagogical methods that Christ uses. But also uh, Mary uses pedagogical methods. You know, they have no wine, and you can see that there's a lot of learning behind the, the phrase that they have no wine. Uh, there's a whole story behind that. There's a whole learning behind that. Uh, Stabat Mater is, a, is another uh, principle, pedagogical principle, which is a very Marian, which means at the foot of the cross. So, you know, we learn from Mary what it means to be at the foot of the cross and its significance. And the third and more obvious uh, pedagogical method from the Blessed Mother is her presence. Uh, think, for instance, in the Senegal, when the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles and the disciples, uh, she was there. Uh, she was there among them. And her presence made a difference. So there's a certain learning of uh, having, you know, her presence and her connection with the Holy Spirit. So again, these are just examples of uh, Jesus and Mary with respect to, you know, formation techniques. Uh, and I think it, it, the reason I'm providing this is, you know, this is not unique to Schoenstatt or unique necessarily to college or universities, but certainly, you know, part of the way that we teach and part of the way that we learn in the church. So let me go ahead and talk a little bit about uh, Father Kentenich's pedagogical principles. There are five basic principles, and he likes to illustrate these uh, as a star within a star. Uh, it shows each one of those little peaks of the star is a covenant. But, you know, we're also talking about an, entirely, an, an entirety. When we talk about a star, we don't talk about the points. We talk about the star is a whole that consists of five points or so we will be talking about the points separately because we can't just cover everything at once. So we have to take them linearly, and then at the end, we'll try to combine them. But the first and most fundamental pedagogy is the covenant pedagogy. So what is that? It's basically, you know, forming yourselves to a personal relationship with the Blessed Mother. Um, this basically opens a portal to be able to understand the charisms 
and the formation, the graces that go along with formations uh, along the lines of, of Schoenstatt. So, you know, this attachment to, to the Blessed Mother uh, is unitive, similar, and creative. In other words, love tends to unite. Love tends to make one similar with one and the other. And of course, the creative force that comes from the graces that uh, are available and the shrine through the Blessed Mother uh, certainly provide us with a certain force that maybe other um, institutes or maybe other movements just do not have. So through this love of Mary, you know, the person, each one of us, and the community receives strength to overcome uh, many aspects of our culture and at the same time help move forward uh, the ideals and the mission of Schoenstatt. Um, so the covenant is a force, a strong force, and that's how we typically want to start. Think about um, how Schoenstatt has evolved in the last, I would say, 25 or 50 years. I mean, starting from something very simple, all of a sudden it becomes this almost tsunami force uh, that goes throughout the entire globe. Um, every continent in the globe has, you know, it, it has Schoenstatt one way or another. Um, if you look, for instance, at how many shrines we have about throughout the globe, we certainly have more than 200. So you can see that, you know, the, the force of the covenant is real, not only at global level or at church level, but also uh, individually. You can see, for instance, how, you know, the many saints and saints-to-be that have can't come out of, of, of Schoenstatt because of, of that force and because of receiving that graces that help overcome, you know, many of the issues are, that affect our culture, that our culture affect us, and that impede in our mission. So here's some examples of where we really need personal and communal strength. Uh, and this is where the covenant is uh, is very active. You know, this idea of attending retreats, workshop, pilgrimage, and meetings, we've seen in the past that when this is in parish, uh, parishioners say, oh, I got to attend another meeting. Oh, I got to attend another retreat. Oh, I got to attend another pilgrimage. I've been there before. So, you know, this reluctance to dive into formation is something that, you know, we just can't afford. Because again, one of the primary uh, drives in Schoenstatt is formation. So we have to find ways to overcome, uh, you know, these difficulties. And of course, the way to overcome them is, you know, through the Blessed Mother, through the graces of the shrine, and through a dialogue, a personal dialogue with her. Another uh, area where the Blessed Mother can provide strength, um, you know, and the covenant can provide strength is with the tensions and difficulties that occur at home, and be it with spouse, be it with uh, other family members, um, be it, you know, even within the Schoenstatt family. I mean, we have to look at what are those tensions, and sometimes, you know, we just don't mix and mingle for some reason. Chemistries are different, but we had to find ways to overcome those because, you know, we just can't uh, harbor those tensions and difficulties in our hearts or in our homes without dealing with them. But we also know that it's very difficult to deal with them by ourselves. So what we do is, you know, we depend here on the Blessed Mother. Um, also, there's, you know, sometimes as, as people move forward in understanding and learning about Schoenstatt, you come to a wall where you say, I don't understand this. Uh, why do we have to do this? Uh, what is the purpose of this particular uh, item or of this particular principle? So, you know, being able to dialogue with the Blessed Mother, being able to dialogue with others that have more experience and more time in Schoenstatt will, will help overcome those biases. But if those biases never come out, if, you know, you have something that is difficult to understand and you never ask about it, then you can see that that's stealing as well uh, some of the energy, so to speak, or some of the drive that we're looking for, some of the intensity of the drive that we're looking for in terms of formation. So that covers uh, covenant spirituality, and you can see that it is fundamental. It is step number one in the most important, I would say, pedagogical principle to get started with. The other uh, pr second principle is attachments pedagogy. And what do we mean by that? You know, when we deal with healthy people, we become healthy as well. If we end up, you know, with a mix of 
healthy people and people that are not healthy. And we depend as much on both. Uh, you know, uh, when we look at those that, that are not healthy, we tend to create habits that are not, you know, healthy in themselves. And, you know, this has a name, it's called codependency. So, you know, as you look at, at the way that you culture, uh, that you cultivate, you know, interpersonal relationships, the healthier they are, the better. And I think this is the richest educational means to achieve, you know, a lot of good things, you know, harmony, shelter, satisfy the need for security, support, et cetera, and also realize the, the path to holiness. Uh, when we have an attachment with a particular saint, for instance, if you re read a book of saints or, you know, look at the lives of, you know, those that aspire the sainthood in, in Schoenstatt, you can see that, you know, that has an, an influence on us. Uh, many times, and I think you, in your experience, you've seen this, or at least heard this, that somebody uh, becomes much more energized and much more aligned in their spiritual life when they see and they are able to read the life of a particular saint, um, you know, that energizes them, it gives them ideas, it moves them forward. In my case, uh, I, I really subscribe to the image of, of St. Paul. Uh, St. Paul and I have a lot in common, or I should say, I have a lot in common with St. Paul. So, you know, every time I dive into either reading or, you know, uh, the places that I go to, uh, I look for St. Paul. And that's one of those things that energizes me. So so you can see that that's a, a pedagogy of attachment. And I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if any of you are already doing that. But now it has a name, pedagogy, uh, attachments or pedagogy. So these bonds uh, and these attachments are not only to persons, but also to places, to ideas and objects. For instance, the attachment that we have with the shrine, uh, be it wherever it is. I mean, Isabel and I, in our travels, we try as much as possible to visit uh, the shrines in those countries. And when we visit the shrine, it's like we're at home. You know, it's, you know, that all of them are the same, basically. So, you know, there's a sense of home being home wherever we are on the globe as we travel. Um, but you can also talk about uh, pedagogy of attachment with ideas. You know, so when we have uh, different, um, let's say, di different objectives, different I I ideals, um, then once we get attached to them, uh, we also are exercising this attachment uh, pedagogy. With the same with objects. Uh, we are attached to objects. We're attached, for instance, to the image of the Blessed Mother. We're attached also to the rosary. Uh, we are attached to holy water. So you can see that that this pedagogy of attachment emphasizes that, yes, these, these, uh, these places, ideas, and objects are, you know, part of the fiber, so to speak, of our, our spirituality of, of our lives. And to be able to promote that, we promote it through the attachment pedagogy. So the attachments, uh, just like we said, uh, the, the covenant provides the force. The attachment provides the means of formation. Um, and uh, you can see some of the examples that I've already talked about uh, in terms of images or personal symbols. It may be, for instance, that you have a personal symbol. Uh, I don't know what that may be. Uh, but if you have a personal symbol, that in itself is an attachment of idea. Uh, and again, it, it is within the realm of attachments of pedagogy. So the covenant is basically the force, um, the attachments, are basically the means. But let's talk about the movement pedagogy, what that means. So the movement pedagogy means that as we move forward, our growth is organic. And what does organic mean? It means it's slow. It means it's true to nature. It also means that it interacts with the environment. So our spiritual growth, for instance, should be slow. It should be true to the nature, true to who we are, true to our uniqueness. And at the same time, it interacts with the environment. As you grow spiritually, you, you others can feel that and perceive that. So it's an interaction with the environment, the same way that, that as others grow, we can see that they have an indirect effect on us as well. So organic formation and growth is, you know, one of the basic principles of this pedagogy of movement. Uh, sometimes our growth is too mechanical. In other words, we, you know, 
read a whole bunch of books and read about this and, and a whole bunch of YouTube videos, but it doesn't make any effect on the soul. Because again, you know, we're talking about a process that is slow. It would be nice if we had a way to accelerate the, you know, in terms of our spiritual growth, but it truly, it is a slow process. And of course, there are enough uh, impediments in our culture uh, to keep that slow. But at the same time, those impediments uh, that are keeping us slow are motivational to, to start moving faster. So the, here, the idea is that you move forward, but you move slow and you move true to your nature because the interaction with the environment will occur. And I think one of the characteristics or the attributes of the movement pedagogy is, you know, motivation is coming from the inside. Uh, there are very few external demands uh, from, from Schoenstatt. Uh, some of the other spiritualities have very strict demands. Uh, for instance, the Jesuits are very strict on what they expect every person that joins them to be able to accomplish. Uh, and that basically comes from the outside towards the inside. Uh, the Benedictines the same way. The Benedictines uh, have a series of rules that you have to follow, and those rules are very strict, and you're expected to abide by them and mold yourself to them. So those are, you know, again, external demands. But Schoenstatt is looking more for what is on the inside that comes out uh, of, of each, each person. You know, generate that strength from the inside as opposed to, you know, from external demands. Does that mean the Schoenstatt doesn't have any, any demands at all? No, that it means that it's minimal. Uh, I think you know that the covenant itself uh, has a series of promises and demands, but I mean, that's basically it. Uh, so, you know, there are no other demands, so to speak, that are coming from the outside. Um, there could be others, but the truth is that they're minimal compared to some of the other schools of spirituality. And of course, you know, this is the idea here is to awaken and to motivate each one's originality. You know, Shunshad does not believe in mass education or formation. In other words, we don't take 200 or 300 people, put them in a conference room or in a stadium and try to educate them because the masses cannot be educated. We look at formation individually with respect to the originality of each person and within the group itself. That's why group formation is also important. So when we talk about movement uh, pedagogy, we're talking about a process itself. Um, and the process that we're looking for is a process of growth and a process of learning that is organic in, in nature. Um, you can see the example there on the bottom of the slide. Uh, you know, there because of all the materials that are available on the web, um, sometimes it could be very, very confusing. Um, people just look here and there, pick and choose, and you can see, first of all, that it's something that is fragmented. It may not necessarily align with where you're headed. It may not necessarily be organic, but at the same time, it creates confusion. Uh, so, you know, one of the problems with the web is that, you know, there's a risk of overemphasis on intellectual formation because there are a lot of videos or a lot of material out there. I had uh, one person uh, that did uh, his covenant in March and in May wanted to start, you know, preparing himself as a leader. And I say, you know, that's a little bit too soon. How about if we wait six or eight months to see how, how it goes? And that would be much more organic. So th the truth is that, that, you know, we talk about movement and we talk about organic formation. We're talking about a slow process. Um, in that slow process, we will encounter difficulties and challenges, but at the same time, oh, we'll be able to enjoy some of the graces that come along with, the, with this particular technique. So again, that was movement pedagogy. Let's run in and go into the trust pedagogy and what that means. The trust pedagogy, if you look at, you know, what the definition uh, the church is using, and certainly in scripture, uh, to trust means to obey, obey willingly without knowing what the end is. And I think this is uh, something that we we talk about when we talk about the the. Uh, faith in divine providence, our practical faith in divine providence. We are totally at the mercy of what God wants. We look and we try to discern what is his will and we move forward, even if we don't have all the answers. So that is that is a, that is a trust, a trust 
uh, situation. So learning to respect each other's originality and freedom is also trust. If you don't respect my originality and you don't respect my freedoms, I don't think we can establish trust. But once we have an agreement and once we look at each other's originality, we promote each other's originality, we look for opportunities to free each other from internal strives, then, of course, you know, that awakens a lot of us and it, and it, and it, and it puts a positive spin uh, on formation. So, you know, to be able to develop faith, we have to look for trust because it's basic to a formation. Without trust, I don't think that there could be any formation at all. But within the formation or within, you know, trust, we're looking at two aspects. One is freedom and one is love. If you're not free and you're not free and, and your level of love is minimal, um, this idea of, or, or this principle of pedagogy of trust is not going to work. If you're tied uh, down, if your soul is tied down, uh, it's, it's something, uh, let's say habits, situations, places that you go to are basically your, uh, eating up your freedom, then of course that's going to affect the, the pedagogy because it affects trust. So, and obviously if you're not focusing, focusing as well on love, you can see that, uh, you know, the, the trust is not going to work. If you have a free and loving environment, that's where trust works the best. I think the example is, uh, the, again, like I say, is the practical faith and divine providence that, you know, we really want to know what God has for each of us. We really want to discern what that is. And even if we don't know the end result, we just, you know, almost blindly go into it because, again, we trust in divine providence. Um, one of the exercises that I did a couple of uh, years ago in Puerto Rico with a group of men in a retreat, uh, I asked them, you know, in your day-to-day -day life, um, try to pick out and recognize at least five moments where God provided guidance to you. And, you know, on a daily basis at night, try to, you know, write them down and, you know, we'll take a look at them uh, a month from now. And, you know, after a month, we got together with the men and they were all like, oh, my God, I couldn't believe how many uh, times, you know, that, uh, I received, you know, guidance from, from God, in particular items or promptings from God or, you know, uh, insights uh, with, just by looking at divine providence. So, you know, many of them said, uh, you know, it's not five. I was able to five fifteen. So, again, this idea of being aware of, you know, the pra uh, pra having a practical faith in divine providence is also, you know, part of what this trust pedagogy is, especially if we're free and especially if we're in a state of love. So, you know, why is internal freedom so important and why so much emphasis on it? Well, you know, what slaves the soul steals activity from the soul. If you have, for instance, a series of habits, bad habits, a series of, and, and we're not talking about sins here. We're talking about something a little more sensitive than just sins. You know, bad habits are fine. I, I remember, um, you know, uh, for preparing for a deacon's retreat, uh, I'm eating the kettle fried chips and I'm going through them and I'm going through them and I'm thinking, this is addictive. And I'm saying, I have to stop this. And while I'm thinking through it, what am I doing? I'm eating more chips. So you can see that there are a series of small things that we do. They're not necessarily still sins, but they're things, they're habits, situations, uh, or, or conversations that tend to steal you know, some of that activity from the soul. And the more we are able to free from them, the better uh, inner freedom we have, the better we're able to trust in God. So the last uh, pedagogy is a pedagogy of ideals. And what does that mean? You know, the pedagogy of ideals is, you know, finding ideals or ideas that will help provide, you know, direction to the to, to your spiritual efforts, uh, to your formation efforts. You know, to illuminate the soul with the light of ideals leads us to aspire to a higher degree of holiness. If you're really looking for, for higher degrees of holiness, and we all are in Schoenstatt, we need a true north. And what is that true north? Yes, we can have a common true north, but it's also true that we have an individual, personalized uh, true north. 
And that is the personal ideal. You know, what is the best version of yourself? What is that idea that God had when he created you and he imprinted uh, in you? What was that specific uh, idea of love that, you know, emerged from, from God and made you exist? So we exist because we are uh, a thought of God. And we've existed with God always. Now, of course, we haven't been, so to speak, incarnated. We have to wait for our time in, within the timeline to be able to demonstrate our love to God. But the truth is that, you know, each of us are, are originals. It's not like God said, oh, let's a uh, little factory here and let's make all these people the same and run them through the factory and that's it. No, it's like God made each one of us. And once he finished with that mold, he broke that mold and is not using that mold anymore. That's basically the uniqueness that we have. And that's what we have to look at as one of the most significant ideals. You know, this, uh, this, uh, the trying to untangling of the invented self and the created self. What is the invented self? Well, I try to make my own. I try to, you know, build my own self uh, based on what I think I need. But the problem with that is if you go in the wrong direction, then your true self is going to react to that, uh, to that, you know, false or artificial self. And, you know, when you have the conflict between the true self and the artificial self, what you have is an identity crisis. So, you know, being able to overcome and untangle that invented self and move toward the created self and use that as, you know, that north that light that is shining uh, to, to, towards you know, yourself so you can achieve the best version of yourself, that is uh, pedagogy of ideals. So the pedagogy of ideals is more in relation to the goal. What is the goal? The goal are set by the ideals. So I think here you see, uh, again, the, the entire network, the entire fiber, so to speak, of what the pedagogical principles are. And you can see that there, uh, th there is a lot of interaction between one and the other. It's not like you have to do this one step at a time. They're really, really, really interactive. Once you start with, uh, you know, your covenant, you'll be able to see, you know, start looking for ideals, looking again at your attachments, looking at, you know, the strength and the speed of, of your spiritual life and formation. And, you know, looking at those is issues of trust, uh, of freedom. So again, they all work together, but it's kind of hard to explain uh, something that works together like that. So that's why we had to go linearly and explain each one. But again, remember that there is a relationship. Um, one affects the other. Uh, for example, you know, the movement pedagogy, if you move too fast, uh, that can affect your covenant ped pedagogy, which is a deepening in the relationship with the Blessed Mother. Um, so you can see, again, the interaction between these. Now, I have here a series of um, questions that you can reflect on. I'm not going to ask for you to do these here, these here in public, but, you know, I want, you know, to consider them. You know, the covenant is basically the force, right? So what do I do to make my relationship with the Blessed Mother more personal every day? Uh, if we look at the pedagogy of ideals, which are goals, you know, what are the ideals that are currently guiding my spiritual life? When we look at attachments, what are the means? You know, what are the basic attachments that nourish my life? And what attachments uh, may be missing? You know, what uh, other attachments are there that, you know, I start to look at, start looking at and start developing? And then we talk about movement. We talk about the process. So uh, the question, the reflective question would be, how do I make sure that I'm experiences, experiencing organic processes, and then I'm not, you know, using too many mechanical things in my formation or in my spiritual life. And finally, trust. Trust provides the right environment for learning. So to whom do I trust in my formation efforts? Uh, that, that, that's important to know. Um, I think you've seen this before where, you know, there's a teacher in school or in a university that you don't trust. And as much as you go to class and you try to learn, it doesn't happen because you really don't trust uh, that educator. So finding the right person to help you with your formation, again, is something that we look, we try to keep uh, as an environment in Schoenstatt. So that's basically uh, what I had for this evening. 
Uh, I think, you know, we've talk, been talking here about 42 minutes. So I, you know, wonder if there are any questions or anything that you'd like for me to clarify. Uh, I'd be glad to do that at this point. Now everybody's running to their computers. <laughs> no, um, thank you, uh, Deacon. Um, it's a lot of information, but it's very uh, organized. It is a lot of information, but then again, you know, what we try to do here is put that, you know, carrot up front, so we know where we're headed. Uh, obviously, the the you know trying to do trying to learn this uh, again, you know, in one or two weeks uh, was not the intent. But the intent is that you have a perspective, you have a worldview, you have a vision of what to uh, what to look forward as you do your covenant of love. Thank you. Thank you. Very welcome, Stephen. Very welcome. Anybody else, or, or are we ready to sign off? See, this is where I think it's a good idea to give a test <laughs> or a quiz. <laughs> but then I'm not going to do that because then everybody all of a sudden is going to say, "Oh, my internet's not working." That's right. I already, I already know the excuses. I have a question, Dickens. Yes. Uh, Stefan already uh, mentioned uh, a lot of information, right? So so these days we get so much from so many places. How how do we navigate all this sea of, you know, of data and information? Uh, is there any tip on, on, on what to discard, what to concentrate on? Yeah, I'll uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of the things that I do when, when you know, too many ideas come about. Uh, I'll put the main, uh, you know, first of all, I have to find the time to be able to sit down and, you know, put all of those major uh, topics on a piece of paper and take a look at them all at once and say, you know, this is just too much. I, I, I can't navigate through all these. I have to find a way to prioritize. And once you, you know, on a sheet of paper, you can go ahead and circle, you know, those that you give priority. Then the other ones are kind of like secondary. Yes, they're nice to know, uh, but you put them in the right place and you keep this organic movement, you know, forward. So sometimes you, you want to do all at once, you know, you find five or six different uh, ideas that you want to do because you, you find that they're important. Well, still, you know, five is a little bit too much. If you're able to find maybe one or two and say, let me focus on uh, on these two. And then, you know, over time, uh, depending on how it goes and are learning uh, these one or two, then I'll take another two or three. So I think the idea here is to be able to find the time to be able to digest and be able to determine what are the priorities given my current circumstance. Does that help to you? Yes, thank you. Got it. <laughs> and you probably want to keep a, a journal. If you have a journal, even better, because then you can go back and, like we said, assessments. You can go back after a couple of months and say, well, you know, the two ideas that I had were really good, but I only accomplished one of them. So now I had to focus, change priorities and focus on another one. But having a way to be able to document that uh, is going to help you with assessments. So I hope that works for you, Theo. Yes, thank you so much. Thanks. You're welcome. Anybody else, or are we at the point of announcements and we pass the microphone out to Jenny? I guess that's it. Um, announcement next week, um, we'll have the, it will not be a class per se. It will be the workshop, for the coronation workshop, which all are encouraged to attend. That's August 27. And that is at seven o'clock, not at eight. Um, and that will be given by Father Carlos. And it's the same link like we have right now. I will put that information in the chat. Um, also, I'll be sending you a form that we have to do your covenant um, letter, covenant prayer. It's a, something for you to to have an idea what is expected to write, what you should be writing, but that doesn't mean you have to do it a step by a step. It's just to give you an idea because the class for um, the prayer is September the 17th, a day before your covenant date. You do not want to leave 
to write your covenant prayer the day before. Please, you do want to give it some time to pray about it. What are you offering um, the Virgin Mary while you're asking her? Once again, the, um, how would you say, the six promises in the six demands of the covenant. That has also a lot to do in what you write and will help you also to write your covenant prayer. And then basically we are, now we only have two more classes, which is the spirituality and the consecration prayer. That means we are really at the end. Next month, and it's just you will see it the September 18th will be around the corner. I know uh, Angie, Rosa, and Stefan already told me that they are um, going to seal the covenant of love. Is their desire? To seal the covenant of love from September 18. Thank you so much for responding um, to me because I'm trying to do start doing ordering the medals and getting everything right all ready for September 18. Um, what else? And, um, and that's it. I don't think I. I'm no, absolutely I, sure I forget something, but I will put in the chat. <laughs> Or you can send an email to everybody. So, you know, again, in, in in the sense of applying some of the pedagogical principles, take your time to put that prayer together. Uh, that prayer is going to be, uh, you know, a, a decision point in your life. Because from that moment forward, you know, you're attached to the Blessed Mother and you basically establish the covenant with her. You wouldn't be surprised or you shouldn't be surprised that, that you know that that covenant prayer eventually has some sort of prophetic effect. In other words, you're not a prophet of yourself, but you are a prophet of yourself. Uh, you know, uh, I'm looking uh, at some of the prayers that are done, my own covenant prayer from 55 years ago, and I'm still seeing things that are actual, and still seeing things that I do with the Blessed Mother, and you know, obviously with more depth. Um, but then again, you know, uh, the, the covenant prayer is not only a moment in time, it's a moment in your life, I think is a better way to say it. Um, with respect to the coronation workshops, you know, uh, try to attend them. Uh, th that, you know, that gets you involved with the currents that are happening, that are streams, live streams that are happening in, in Shunstadt. And at the same time, if you can, invite somebody over. Maybe, you know, we'll have another iteration of uh, people interested in the Covenant of Love. Thank you. Come on, Jenny. That's that's it. That's it. So I think that's pretty much it. If it is, then I would ask uh, Jenny, like I did last night, if you want to do the consecration prayer, I'd be delighted to give a blessing at the very end. Oh, I will. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. My Queen, my Mother, I give myself entirely to you, and to show my devotion to you, I consecrate to you this day my eyes, my ears, my mouth, my heart, my entire self without reserve, as I am your own, my good mother, guard me and defend me as your proper and possession. Amen. May the Lord be with you and with your spirit through the intercession of the Blessed Mother and in the name of our Father and Founder, Father Jose Kendanik. May God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.